All right. Let's begin in prayer. Father, we pray now that you will reveal to us not only the clarity of your word, but also the wisdom to know how to interact with those who think so very, very differently from us. Open our eyes that we might behold uh, these important truths and principles and give us insight and understanding that we might know how to conduct ourselves well before you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're continuing on through PSC's book. Um, I think those of you who have bought it, some of you I know have bought it, uh, thoroughly encourage you to buy the book and read it. Perhaps wait till we finished Sunday school um, to do so, but, but definitely, definitely get this book. We are just skimming the surface of what, um, uh, what is contained in, in PSC's book. So the second major chapter is about abortion. We've talked a lot about it already. So some of what I'm doing today is recap, but um, uh, PSC's chapter on abortion is called The Joy of Death, You Must Be Prepared to Kill. And she starts the chapter with uh, a narrative of a British journalist, Antonio, Antonia Senior, uh, who reflected on her own uh, thoughts as she went through childbirth. A senior wrote, my moral certainty about abortion is wavering. My absolutist position is under siege. My daughter was formed at conception. Any other conclusion is a convenient lie that we on the pro-choice side of the debate tell ourselves to make us feel better about the action of taking a life. Okay, so there's a degree of honesty there. I think you'll agree. Confused honesty, but nonetheless, honesty. Uh, how then can she continue to justify uh, her position? Uh, senior rights, you cannot separate women's rights from their right to fertility control. The single biggest factor in women's liberation was our newly found ability to impose our will on our biology. The nearly 200,000 aborted babies in the UK each year are the lesser evil, no matter how you define it. Two things, notice she sees the sexual revolution as liberation. When scripture tells us it brings the very opposite, enslavement. Okay, that, that's how upside down the thinking uh, of even someone who has a degree of honesty about this matter still thinks about the matter. Liberation uh, rather than enslavement. Um, and she defines abortion as an evil. Notice that. It's a lesser evil. And I would say to you there's an inherent contradiction in that position. You cannot hold two diametrically opposed positions and call them both evil. Uh, that is, you cannot hold abortion to be evil and fertility rights, as they call it. Um, you, you cannot hold them both to be good or both to be evil. If something is the opposite of something else, abortion um, uh, being the opposite there, uh, you can't hold them both to be evil. They must either, one must either be good or one must uh, be evil. Either abortion must be good or women's liberation must be good. Both can't be good. Both can't be evil. There's a lesser evil she's speaking of. Ethically, that's not possible. Okay, we need to understand that. Um, the chilling conclusion to her article was this. You must be prepared to kill. Uh, and the good thing that PSE does in all her writing is reference the, uh, um, or footnote rather, all her quotations and so on. Uh, and you can go and find out where they come from. And I've done quite a bit of work going back to those original sources. You'll see in a moment to investigate what's going on in the bigger picture. That, that's a bigger exercise, one which takes a bit more time. Um, it's interesting to me, though, you must be prepared to kill how the battle lines have been redrawn in this debate. Uh, it used to be that life did not begin until um, uh, conception. That was the debate. When does life begin? Uh, Pro-life lobby used to call fetuses potential life. 
Now, by and large, that's not happening. Most people are acknowledging that life begins at conception. Um, and what's happened is that the pro-choice lobby have forced, been forced to change their position on that matter because of science. And it's made them, in a sense, a little bit more honest, as we've seen in this article. Life does begin at conception. There's, there's no doubt about it. The logical conclusion then, uh, and, and Senior is right, if you believe life begins at conception, you must be willing to take life in order to be pro-choice. You must be willing to take life. So the question is, what worldview explains such a drastic devaluation of life? And we know the answer. The answer is personhood theory. That personhood, whatever that means, is placed in the upper realm, the value idea, the personal realm, and not in the fact scientific public realm. So life has been taken out of that equation, and now we're dealing with personhood. They lost the battle on when life begins, in other words. Scientifically, they lost the battle. And so now they've moved the goalpost to continue to suit their predisposition to this sin and this, this awful crime. And now there's a new battle. What is personhood? So a fetus, though intrinsically human, does not possess personhood. And that's not what pro-lifers say, that's what pro-choicers say. Though human does not possess personhood. And given that fact, it can be killed without any moral repercussions. Now the question we need to ask the unbeliever is who decides and how do you decide of what personhood consists? Okay, that's the crucial question. Who decides? Who writes the rule book on this? And if they're willing to ignore scripture as a rule book, or what Christians say as a rule book, then why should we accept what anybody else says about what personhood is? Why should the unbeliever get to write the rule book on this? Who decides what personhood is, and how do you decide of what personhood consists? Well, both the courts, secular and spiritual, have weighed in on this matter of personhood, uh, and we see that Christians are not immune from a failure to understand uh, this mindset of personhood on abortion. Joseph Fletcher, former Episcopal priest, wrote, What is critical is person status, not merely human status. In his view, genetically defective fetuses and newborns do not attain to the status of personhood. He calls them sub-personal and thus fail to qualify for a right to life. Now, if you know anything about your history, that concept of sub-personal ought to just red flags everywhere. Um, that has been the rallying call of, of dictators and, and despots uh, for, for centuries. Hans Kung, liberal Catholic theologian, a fertilized ovum evidently is human life, but it is not a person. Peter Singer, Princeton ethicist, the life of a human organism begins at conception, but the life of a person does not begin so early. Uh, Piercy comments on Singer. She writes, for Singer, simply being human has no moral significance. And if you think it does, you are guilty, listen to this, you are guilty of, guess what? Anyone know? What are you guilty of if you think that being human has significance? You're not going to get it unless you've read the book. This is so far out there. You are guilty of speciesism. Speciesism. Defined as an immoral prejudice in favor of your own species. Isn't it amazing? the length to which people will go to deny God. It's staggering. So speciesism is parallel to racism. Now, if you don't like spiders, that's one thing. But, you know, we're just taking it to an extreme there, of course. Uh, but the secular courts weighed in on this as well. Roe v. Wade, 
uh, interpreted the 14th Amendment in the following way. This is Justice Blackman, who I believe wrote the majority opinion uh, of the court. The word person in the 14th Amendment does not include the unborn. If the suggestion of personhood is established, the fetus right to life would then be guaranteed. So what they've done is interpreted the Constitution and thus made a new law essentially saying the Constitution does not include um, uh, the unborn in the definition of person. So we see then, even though I don't think a lot of the debate has happened upon these lines, that personhood theory is at least as old as 1972-73 when the Supreme Court ruled on this and another case at the same time. It's at least as old as that in America's thinking. Blackman says that very thing there, that they don't qualify as persons under the 14th Amendment. So even though I think much of the debate in, in, in years after that has been on the issue of when does life begin, is there potential life in the womb or real life, actually personhood theory and the foundation for abortion was very clearly set forth in personhood theory in the Supreme Court's ruling. We all clear on that. What I'm saying is I don't think people ran with the ball so much of personhood theory after this ruling, but retreated back to when does life begin issues. And I think somewhere in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years or so, life at conception has become more and more clear to just about everyone. So they've gone away from the life debate and gone back to the personhood debate, which was outlined in the uh, the Supreme Court's ruling on Roe v. Wade. So the 14th Amendment, just so you know, includes, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property. Uh, this ruling says that um, a person does not include the unborn. Um, pray for the Supreme Court. And pray that in, in God's goodwill, this ruling might be revisited. I don't know if it will or not. But pray that it might, and this ruling might be turned uh, on its head. So we see in our current discussion personhood theory uh, really formally being advanced in the Roe versus Wade ruling. But what about the history of personhood theory prior to that? Where did the Supreme Court and others get this idea that a person is separated from the concept of humanity. Where did that come from? Well, first of all, ancient Greece and Plato. Um, Pastor Ockham has been dealing with a kind of dualism that we've seen in, in uh, John's Gospel, a, a spirit-flesh dichotomy, a separation of the two. That's Platonic. Uh, Plato treated the body as being external to oneself, uh, and that's what we call dualism. There's the true essence of a man, and then there's the body. So you can see back as far as Plato, this idea of a separation a, and a diminution of the physical body, the body being largely being viewed as, as evil, a necessary evil, but evil, it's flesh, and so on. Uh, so ancient Greece and Plato put this, this forward. Fast forward 16 or 17 centuries, and we get René Descartes. This is all coming up, is it good? Yeah. Um, we know Descartes for his I think, therefore I am. All right? And that, in, in essence, tells us where Descartes was going on personhood theory. So you can see there um, the division, uh, fact down here, value up here. The fact is the body. The body for Descartes was essentially a mechanism for operating physical, mechanical laws. But the mind, which was free and autonomous, was actually the real expression of self. I think, therefore I am. Not I live, therefore I am. Okay? He said, I think, therefore I am. Uh, and if I think, therefore I am, is true, then authentic human identity is found, as we've said, in the mind alone and not the body, making the body Expendable. Now, there are implications uh, for this, I think, therefore I am. Okay, so here's the pattern for um, 
Descartes this here. Okay? How do we know what's going on in the mind of a fetus? How do we know what's going on in the mind of an infant? Are we really prepared to say that they have no sense of consciousness or an incapacity to think? We simply don't know that. In fact, Christians know the opposite. Uh, listen to this from Luke's Gospel. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed aloud, Blessed are you, Mary, among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting, Mary, to Elizabeth, the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. For joy. Now, somebody might say, well, that's just Elizabeth interpreting, but that, that comes to us as Holy Scripture. Uh, we know that David speaks of, of trusting from his earliest days. Good question. Well, it's more a statement. Can you flush out the details? But the instructor yesterday, the timeline appears to the conception of Christ was about one month, and Elizabeth was about six months pregnant. So we're talking in a sort of early term here. So we're not talking about late time, but you don't need to instruct every timeline. It's a very early thing, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, not that it matters, not that it matters. It, it's, it's in utero. So the, the leap for joy was John the Baptist responding to the presence of Christ while yet in the womb. Okay, so there's an issue there. How do we know what's going on in the mind of a fetus? It seems to me to be a great assumption that is being made on the part of science. And I don't have any science to document this or not. Uh, that we cannot know what's going on there. So I think, therefore, I am. I yeah, please. How do I know when they part the body? I mean, <laughs> the only way we That's ever right. know any intent is by how it manifests itself. Yes. Uh, I'll come to that in a moment, actually, but good point, yes. Um, but then there's the issue of design as well, the discrepancy between fact and value. Uh, again, it's thoroughly inconsistent. We know body and mind belong together. It's the way God created us. One controls the other, and the other, in various ways, feeds back into the mind. Um, you can't operate a human being according to this pattern. It's not going to work. There'll be collapse, total collapse. And we do see people try and operate this way. And there's physical and mental collapse because the two belong together. And it's only in this area of life, when it comes to faith issues, that we actually operate that way. There's no other area of life, as far as I can see, where we actually operate in this way, apart from when it comes to God issues. Because we know it doesn't work. Um, and then the point which Mike made then, it. it, it the separation of body, the Cartesian dualism. Cartesian is the adjective to describe Descartes' thinking. Cartesian dualism, the separation of body and mind, is inconsistent. How can a mind control a body whose behavior is determined by mindless mechanical laws? In other words, uh, what happens out here physically is a, a manifestation of what goes on in the mind. So the mind is given expression through the body which is why there can't be a separation between the two. Uh, we need to be clear, the logic of abortion, at least since Descartes, um, is this. The mind has been regarded as the authentic self. The body reduced to sub-personal, functioning solely on the level of biology and chemistry. And while few serious ethicists now disagree that life begins at conception, that is no longer the issue for them. Uh, when the body has been, listen, depersonalized, when the body has been depersonalized, it can be changed however one wants. Hence, all the chapters deal with changes to how people live, body type changes homosexuality, transgenderism, and so on. 
Why? Because they've depersonalized the body. And thus the core question is, is the human body an integral part of the person or a piece of matter that we can control and manipulate? If we accept this logic, de facto we work with this body-spirit dualism. Uh, but the reality is that's often hidden in the way people think. So you're not going to find a lot of people walking around, going to abortion clinics, say, hey, I'm operating with personhood theory and my body. They're not going to work like that. Um, and Piercy has a very valuable short section speaking about why people seek out abortions. And she spoke of speaking to Christian women that have told her that they consider abortions out of fear of losing something, jobs, opportunities, and so on. Uh, others about what fear, uh, out of fear, out of what their church will say. So perhaps those being pregnant out of wedlock. Um, we need to be very clear here. Sex outside of marriage is a serious sin. It's a serious sin, but it is in no way the unpardonable sin. No way can it be the unpardonable sin. And the church must have both pastoral discipline and pastoral grace. And that goes for all of us. It's not just the elders that should exercise such, but everyone in the body. Um, and the penitent... No penitent ought ever to be excommunicated from the Church of Christ, either formally or informally. It's possible to excommunicate someone without the church doing it. It's what the members can do, or the elders can do. So while we're dealing with sin issues, yes, we acknowledge that. But we need to situate those sins properly in the scale of, of biblical revelation, serious sin, but not unpardonable, not unforgivable. And we're not in the business of shunning those who, though they have sinned, are repentant. So it ought never be the case in this church or in the church, someone who falls into this kind of sin should ever consider thinking of this radical kind of departure from the faith because they fear what we might think of them. Did I see a hand going up somewhere? No? Okay. So PSC has a very useful uh, section on that. So the big question is, how do we define personhood? Um, and the, if personhood, uh, for the pro-choice person now, is not equated with being biologically human, in what does personhood consist? And here's the troubled area for the pro-life lobby, because there is no agreement on what personhood actually is. So suggestions, when the organism begins to feel pain, when it has a certain level of cognitive function, when it develops consciousness or intelligence, a sense of the future. I mean, how do you ever determine that? It's preposterous, isn't it? Um, Joseph Fletcher, uh, founder of situa Situational Ethics, uh, came up with 15 definitions of purposehood. Some of them you can see there before you uh, on the board. Intelligence, self-awareness, self-control, sense of time, so on. How on earth do you measure this in people? They're unmeasurables, it seems to me. Pain might not be, but some of these other ones are, are immeasurable. So, the come, back, come back to the, the, the killer question. Who decides what elements make up personhood? And to what level or extent must they be present in the, in the individual for that individual to be a person? That's the question we need to be asking of people. Who decides and what goes into personhood and to what level or extent must they be present? Okay, it's a really important question. Um, secular ethicists, scientists cannot agree on that matter, but interestingly, the arch-atheist 
Friedrich Nietzsche argued the Christian concept of the equality of souls before God furnishes the prototype of all theories of equal rights. And that idea was enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life. So Nietzsche's saying, yeah, we, we get this idea of the equality of the souls of all men from Christianity. Though he denied God, he said that's where we get it from. But then listen to the other side of the argument. Bioethicist John Harris. Nine months of development leaves the human embryo far short of the emergence of anything that can be called a person. A person is a creature capable of valuing its own existence. Non-persons or potential persons cannot be wronged in this way because death does not deprive them of anything they can value. If they cannot wish to live, they cannot have that wish frustrated by being killed. Now notice here, Harris has made uh, a number of judgment calls here. A number of judgment calls. All of which, as far as I'm concerned, are up for grabs. Um, what a fetus can or cannot experience. What can they or cannot experience? That's a judgment call. What death or murder is here is a judgment call. And in what conditions can death or murder be administered, if you like, to certain people? They're all judgment calls. Nathan. Thank you. Thank you. Francis Crick. Anyone know who Francis Crick is? Yeah. Co-founder of, 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 of DNA. He wrote this. No newborn infant should be declared human until it has passed certain tests regarding its genetic endowment. And if it fails these tests, it forfeits the right to life. Sorry? Yeah. Peter Singer, who we spoke of earlier, ethicist Princeton, says this a three year old is a gray case. Whew. That's not a gray case. It would seem. Yeah. It's chilling, isn't it? it it's <sighs> astonishing. Um, it gets worse. I quoted these two philosophers in this paper in a sermon about eight, ten months ago. Uh, Gublini and Minerva in the Journal of Medical Ethics, they're both, uh, one's at Oxford and one's at Ghent. Merely being human is not itself a reason for ascribing uh, someone a right to life. Fetuses and newborns are not persons. Since non-persons have no moral right to live, there are no reasons for banning after-birth abortions. So now we've gone past the moment of birth. It's not just a matter of, of what's in utero, but, but there's birth. There's life. In your hands. And yet they're non-persons with no moral right to life. And so we're seeing here very clearly the elements of personhood theory. Humanity does not equate to personhood. Humanity exists in the lower story and thus has, sorry, the upper story. I should have said personhood exists in the upper story and thus has no, um, no objective moral value. Excuse the typo there. PSC likens this thinking 
and language to that of Nazi Germany. Um, we want to be careful that we don't just throw that out as a, an accusation. I did a lot of research this week because I had time on my hands with <laughs> Council Conference. A lot of research into Nazi Germany. And it wasn't easily available to find uh, overtly uh, their descriptions of the various races and peoples that they ended up viewing as subhumans. It's not easy. Um, in the past, I've read some of that stuff. I, I couldn't find it to hand right now. Not even the Nuremberg Laws, which stipulated what made you a Jew or what percentage Jew you were, doesn't speak in these ways. But um, the, uh, the manner in which they treated people showed evidently that they were working with a personhood theory. Um, anybody remember Joseph Goebbels' famous propagandist um, uh, movie where he interspersed pictures of Jews with rats and flashed them back and forth on the screen? Jew, rat, Jew, rat. I mean, obviously what he's trying to say. They're subhuman. They're rats. Um, so that they held that is, is very clear. Uh, that um, allegation drives pro-choice people up the wall. So use it carefully and wisely. I'm not saying you shouldn't use it. I'm saying use it carefully and wisely. Um, PSC makes the point that the Germans didn't start out just by gassing the Jews. That they did start with uh, the mentally ill, the handicapped, and so on. Uh, and they did use the phrase, um, a life that's not worth living. Which is interesting, she notes, because that same phrase is used in the 2013 paper in the Journey of, Journal of Medical Ethics by Gubellini and Minerva. People whose life is not worth living. Okay, so the parallels are real, but we need to be a bit careful just throwing around, oh, well, that's what Nazi Germany said. Well, somebody say, prove it. And that's on you to prove it. So just be careful, just be careful using certain kinds of language. Easy to bring heat to the discussion, without bringing light. So, okay, that should have been, that's fine. So does a pro-life view of personhood rest on faith or science? That's us. Does pro-life rest on faith or science? It's an assertion that's used against us. Oh, your position is based on faith and not science. Um, Oh, I think I should have edited this, but anyway. Drop down to the second point. Um, PC says, no one argues about the moral worth of human life until scientific evidence first establishes that life exists. Everyone understand that? There's no point debating the value of life that is not there. And yet we know that life exists by the scientific method. We observe it exists. And so that's when we begin to really debate the, the point in, in each instance. Uh, and this idea is what was behind the 19th century laws in this country um, banning abortion in the U.S. It was not pastors pursuing that. It was scientists, physicians. Um, from the earliest stages of debate, life and personhood were inextricably linked together. That's to say they couldn't be separated. Life and personhood. And it was science rather than faith which was the driving force for that issue. Science rather than faith linked personhood with life. So where does the pro-choice person derive their position, science or faith? Their assertion is that you can be human without being a person. Now we would never apply this to animals. You know, can you be a cat without having cathood, or a dog without having doghood? Um, when you look at a pregnant animal, or an animal nursing its newborn, we don't dis dispute the status of the newborn in question. It's a dog, even if it's a puppy. The outward form matches the inward reality, and so on. And yet when it comes to humans, we do something quite different. And we know there's a difference between humans and animals, uh, and yet, sense of pain, sense of danger, 
emotions. We clearly see them in, in some animals, never in cats, often in dogs. <laughs> Not quite true, if you're a cat lover. So, ultimately what we're seeing is that personhood theory is not a result of science, but is the result of uh, value. Okay? I hope this comes out correctly. Good. All right. Let's apply the fact-value split to personhood theory itself. Not how personhood theory is manifested in abortion or in transgenderism, whatever it might be, but let's apply the fact-value split to personhood theory itself. Fact. Remember, facts beneath the line, uh, value above. Are there agreed scientific, public, or objective facts to define personhood? Those public, non-negotiable matters which will define personhood, we know the answer is no, because we've just seen that. Which, by definition, means that personhood theory belongs in what realm? In the realm of value. It doesn't belong in the realm of fact. It belongs in the realm of value. And the irony is that pro-choice people tell us their arguments are scientific and so on, when in reality they're all about value. They're the very opposite. It's what they want. So even their own method falls foul to the fact-value split. Not at just their conclusions, Unsurprisingly, their method is flawed as well. And what's the implication if, if personhood theory, abortion, transgenderism, all this stuff that we're going to look at, falls in, in this area here? What's the implication? Sorry? Exactly. We are not looking at scientific fact principle which for them is, is non-negotiable. So just the other day, I was born this way, I'm homosexual, I was born this way. A report just came out, I'm trying to remember from where it was, but um, it wasn't like a, you know, a right-wing group or anything like that. There is no gene which defines homosexuality. Yeah, it was on the BBC website, that's right. I can't remember who, who the company, which for the BBC is remarkable, by the way, but... Um, but the group doing it was not a right-leaning, it was a left-leaning. There is no gene which establishes homosexuality. I was born this way is nonsense. It's not to say someone wasn't born with, with perhaps inclinations towards a particular sin. I mean, after all, we're all born with inclination to sin. So let's be clear about that. But the, uh, an irreversible condition genetic condition which produces this or any other behavior in the sphere we're talking about does not exist. We're back in the realm of value. What I want it to be. What pleases me. My interpretation of the facts. Did I get it right? <laughs> I shoot you with my laser, so watch out. <laughs> Just as I think an additional evidence to this point, it is very, the students are very quick when they are challenged to go into an I feel or I believe. Mm -hmm. I do not allow in my class. The words I feel or I believe are not allowed to be said. So when they say it, I buzz them. They have to go back to a rational, fact-based argument. It is almost impossible for them to do. I bet you don't win any popularity awards, do you? <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's always I feel... I of course it is. Right. And because it's I feel, it trumps everything. It trumps everything. It happens in the church. It happens all the time. I believe you did something wrong, so I'm going to camp out on that until... The cows come home. You know, uh, well, it's got to have some bearing in fact. <laughs> it's got to have some bearing in fact. Everything we do has to have some bearing in a principle or fact which is God-given. It must be.
Dick. Mm, absolutely. Al Gore's, in, was it Inconvenient Truth? Was that his, his movie about global warming? I don't know about the truth bit on that. Let's not get into global warming. But that's the reality that facts are inconvenient truths. And, and they regulate a discussion. Daisy, very quickly, because I want to get to something that Dick said in my next... Sure. Absolutely. 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 Which is which gives the lie to those who would say, if you presented me with enough evidence, I'd believe. Our Lord said, clearly not. Even if someone should come back from heaven, they won't believe. Clearly not. It's not about do you have enough evidence, it's about the disposition of your heart. Let me move on. Where's all this heading? What Dick just said is very uh, helpful to, to move into this the last few minutes we've got now. 7th, 8th, 9th of July, June 2016, group of philosophers and bioethicists get together in Geneva um, to deal with the issue of, of conscientious objection in providing uh, health care. PSC mentions this. I went to the document itself they produced. It's online, worth reading, and worth reading the comments beneath it. I'd encourage you all to do that. Um, and the document is called The Consensus Statement on Conscientious Objection in Healthcare. I'm going to whiz through their, their statements now, but go and, go and look up this up online and look at the objections to it below in the comments. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. One, healthcare practitioners' primary obligations are towards their patients, not toward their own personal conscience. When the patient's well-being or best interest or health is at stake, Healthcare practitioners' professional obligations should normally take priority over their personal, moral, or religious views. Not got time to discuss it. I'm going to go through all of them. In the event of conflict between practitioners' conscience and a patient's desire for legal, professionally sanctioned medical service, healthcare practitioners should always ensure that patients receive timely medical care. When they have a conscientious objection, they ought to refer their patients to another practitioner who is willing to perform the treatment. In emergency situations, when referral is not possible or when it poses too great a burden on patients or on the healthcare system, healthcare practitioners should perform the treatment themselves. Third, healthcare practitioners who wish to conscientiously object to providing medical treatment should be required to explain the rationale for their decision. Uh, the status quo for regarding conscientious objection in healthcare in the UK and several other modern Western countries is indefensible. Okay, I'm going to skip down uh, the last sentence. The burden of proof to demonstrate the reasonability and the sincerity of the objection should be on the healthcare practitioner. Five, accordingly in such countries, these reasons, uh, the reasons healthcare practitioners offer for their conscientious objection could be assessed by tribunals, just that very word, tribunal, oh, which could test the sincerity, strength, and the reasonability, there we go, reasonability, of healthcare practitioners' moral objections to certain medical services. Point six, going down halfway through to the italicized, this implies that regional authorities, in order to be able to provide medical services in a timely manner, should be allowed to make hiring decisions on the basis of whether possible employees are willing to perform medical procedures to which other healthcare practitioners have a conscientious objection. So, seeing the Christians, other 
conscientious objectors being frozen out of the market there. Okay? Seven, healthcare practitioners who are exempted from performing certain medical procedures on conscientious grounds should be required to compensate society and the health system for their failure to fulfill their professional obligations by providing public benefiting services. <laughs> medical students should not be exempted from learning how to perform basic medical procedures and they should do them in their training basically. Healthcare practitioners should be educated to use a framework of decision making incorporating legal, ethical, and professional arguments to identify the basis of their objection. In other words, they get re-educated. Re-education, you know where that comes from, don't you? Ten, healthcare practitioners should also be educated to reflect on the influence of cognitive bias in their objections. Look it up, the consensus statement on conscientious objection in healthcare, and please read the comments underneath. If you found the right place where it's, it's at, it's kind of bluish website. I should have put the website up there. But you'll find it and read the comments underneath, not even from people who would be like, like us, just from people in the industry who see the, 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 the gaping holes in this kind of argument. Don't think that this is just somewhere off in Switzerland and in academia. It's going to work its way in sooner or later. To be, to be very clear about that. So we're seeing, we've seen the past, the present, and possibly something of the future here. Next week, we're going to come back to the subject of abortion and see how we should think more clearly as Christians about the matter. I hope we're seeing the, the colossal assumptions that exist in personhood theory. Colossal assumptions, which as far as I know, don't have scientific um, uh, substantiation uh, and know that there are real and genuine problems in the way people have begun to think or have thought for a long time about the human body. Piercy's answer is love thy body. That's the name of her book, Love Thy Body. That comes with its own caveats, but certainly don't hate your bodies, okay? Our body is God-given. It's God-created. It's God-given and has a certain dignity attached to it. Let's pray. Gracious God, we do bless you for you have, in a fearful and wonderful fashion, blessed us with our bodies. Oh, how we thank you, Lord, and praise your great name for rescuing us from this same darkness that we see before us now. Oh, Lord, rescue more, we pray. And if it be your will, use us in this respect to speak truth and light into the hearts of those that do not know you. Overcome the darkness of their hearts and thoughts and be pleased to glorify yourself in the salvation of sinners and in the preservation of lives of babies. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.